Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this last lunch of the Ricina Dialogue. I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for having us here, for inviting us uh, to hold this conversation, this forward-looking conversation. I think day three deserves conversations that look to the future and insert a bit of foresight uh, tying together all the trends we've been looking at. I'm going to introduce the topic and the panel in a moment. Uh, for those I don't know, I'm Elena Lazaro. I'm a senior fellow at ELIAMAP, the Hellenic Institute for European and Foreign Policy. You've seen there's a few Greeks here this time, so I'm one of them. I'm also an associate fellow at Chatham House on the US and Americas program. Um, I'm not a Middle East expert, but we're going to have a very interesting discussion about the wider Middle East and Gulf region today. Uh, housekeeping rules, I think by now you all know the Ricina lunch code. You can have your starter now, and then we'll have the conversation for about 50 minutes, and you'll be served the not free lunch right after. Um, we'll try to keep our discussion to 30, 35 minutes and then open the floor to your questions, so keep those questions prepared. Um, our panel today uh, will focus on uh, West Asia, uh, which in itself has caused some discussion among the speakers. Uh, the term West Asia referring to the Middle East, the Gulf, and the wider region, but very interestingly, as it is looked at from India, and I think this in itself speaks to the value of Raisina, because several of us think of that region in different categories, so it caused us to open maps and look and discuss already. Um, and what we'll be discussing essentially are... Uh, is how the future might reconcile several of the positive trends that have been mentioned in the conference and that we've been seeing in parts of the region prior to October 7th. Uh, by this, I'm referring to uh, the normalization of uh, Israel's relations with a number of Arab states, uh, the infrastructure and connectivity uh, projects that we've heard a lot about in those three days, the IMAC, perhaps the I to you two, um, we'll be discussing also the economic, uh, econ economic climate and digital uh, agendas of uh, several of the states in the region, but also the economic instability and the potential consequences in other states in the region that is equally important. But of course, all of this will be discussed in the context of what's happened on October 7th, the um, uh, terrorist attacks on Israel and the humanitarian crisis ensuing from the Israeli response. Uh, and of course, the big question for our speakers looking to the future will be, is it possible to somehow uh, reconcile or rather have a, a forward-looking agenda for the region? What are the prospects for the region in the context of this conflict and what are the ideas for the way ahead. Before I introduce the speakers, I also want to mention that uh, in my research to moderate this panel, I came across an article by uh, James Tavridis, Bloomberg, October 6, 2023. And the title is, Iran makes this the moment for a US-Israel-Saudi grand bargain. Uh, that's October 6, 2023. I think it speaks very much to the topic of where we were, where we thought we were going, and where we are right now. And these are the questions that our panelists today will be called on to discuss. Um, we will be starting with Hans Christian Hagman, Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategy, the Prime Minister's Office in Sweden, and very much involved in strategic planning and foresight. Um, then uh, we will proceed uh, with Mina al Arabi, editor in chief at the National, uh, based in the United Arab Emirates. Um, Vali Nasra, professor in international affairs and Middle East studies, Johns Hopkins University, SAIS, based in the US. Maha Akil, lecturer at Dar al Hikma University, of Saudi Arabia. And to uh, wrap it all up for the first round, John Chipman, Executive Chairman at the IISS International Institute for Strategic Studies UK. So a diversity of views and regions. Uh, looking forward to a great conversation. Uh, so, um, Hans, would you start us off with your view of the region, the geoeconomic and geopolitical uh, state of play, and what do you think we should be looking at? Well, thank you very much, uh, and thank you to ORF for convening us all in this conversation. 
Uh, and I would like to contribute some more uh, strategic observations. But in the spirit of Donald Rumsfeld, if you can't solve a problem, enlarge it. That's what we need to do. So despite the despicable um, Hamas attacks on October 7 and the dire plight of civilians in Gaza, it is a fact that the geopolitical and geoeconomic impacts so far have been limited. Now, I'd like to offer three perspectives. I would like to start with the regional perspective. It is a fact that alliances have not changed since the Hamas attacks. There is no mass mobilization. There is no conflict between states. It is essentially limited to Israel Hamas, Israel Hezbollah, and also the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. I'll get back to those. And only indirectly is Iran, Russia, and the US involved. Uh, in, in this conflict. On the topic of the Red Sea and the Houthi attacks, which really are the economic consequences, uh, those are uh, made in the name of those who support the war on Israel. Now, 15% of global shipping passes the Red Sea on a normal day. 30% of container traffic. Now, very much of this is the EU uh, Asian traffic. A lot of, or most of the Indian traffic, and 60% of the EU Chinese traffic passes the Red Sea on a normal day. However, the attacks are only focused on the Western countries. Uh, Chinese shipping, Russian shipping so far, are exempt from this. And what I've seen so far, no Indian registered ships have been attacked either. So this is a regional threat, but it is hardly strategic. Now, rerouting costs about 7 to 12 extra days of transport. Instead of going through the Red Sea, you have to go around uh, all of Africa. Now, this is a problem, but it is hardly a strategic issue. Container costs have doubled, but they're still only a third of what they were during the COVID peak. A container from Asia to Rotterdam costs about $5,000 today. Uh, but we have to put this in perspective. A TV, a flat screen TV, um, costs about twelve and a half dollars to transport from Asia to Europe. Yes, that is double from where it was a few months ago. It cost five dollars then, but it's still twelve and a half dollars from a seven, eight, nine hundred dollar TV. And there's been zero impact on the oil price. Brent price this morning was eighty three dollars. That's relatively manageable in many ways. And we should also be grateful for the US Navy's engagement in this. Despite Chinese involvement and support and cooperation, much stronger now with Saudi Arabia, with the UAE, and with the initiatives, not least when we talk about the BRICS Plus. The BRICS Plus has not been mobilized in this cause to secure the flows through the Red Sea. And to be honest, the Hormuz is the really important one, because that's where you have the flows of energy, not just shipping. Shipping can be removed in a much easier way, where if you stop uh, energy, that's a different thing. But things could escalate. That brings me to the second perspective, that Iran is the major concern in this case. How does Iran choose to engage and use this opportunity to play out? But it is all about, will the great powers, and I'm thinking of the United States, Russia, and China, become involved, yes or no. There's also about the major players in the region. And then I'm thinking of Saudi Arabia, which is by far the biggest military and one of the biggest economies in the region. I'm thinking about Turkey, which yes, is geographically part of Western Asia. Anatolia is part of Western Asia. And it's a huge economy, a big population. We talk about Israel, which is a, operationally a large armed force, small in numbers, but very operationally effective. And then we have the UAE, of course, and uh, Egypt and Iran as important players. Now, those make it a strategic player. But honestly, the whole region is not a player when it comes to foreign direct investments. They're not in the top 10 when it comes to outbound or inbound foreign direct investments. And the Middle East is only 4% of global GDP in PPP terms. You can add Turkey, which is another 2%, and you can add Egypt, which is 1% of global GDP. So together, the great church, you would say Western Asia, is on par with India when it comes to GDP. 
But to be honest, if you take away energy from the equation, or the location and the flows, the Middle East is not quite as strategic as we sometimes think. Now the big question is proliferation. What happens if other countries acquire nuclear weapons? I think of Iran, I speculate about Saudi Arabia, maybe others. That would change the equation uh, entirely. And finally, the cataclysmic perspective, which we need to bear in mind. The probability is low, but that is the use of nuclear weapons or the involvement of the United States, China, or Russia in direct military action. I do not see that on the map, but we need to, the consequences are so dire that we need to have that in mind. And as long as that is not, it is not of cataclysmic, of existential threat to the world. It is only geoeconomic and geopolitical. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans Christian, and a lot there on the economic potential, uh, but also on the potential uh, challenges to, to harness in it. Um, I'd like to move to Mina. Now, Mina, you've worked a lot on the Palestinian issue, so I'd like to ask you, uh, if you if you think it is possible to harness that potential without addressing the Palestinian issue first, is there a sequence there? Um, and perhaps to respond to Hans Christian's comments. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me here. The title of the session spoke of old and new, and I guess uh, from October 7th, what was old is now new. It cannot be ignored. So a very succinct answer to your question is, no, you can't ignore the Palestinian issue. And I think there was thought that maybe you, you could, but the takeaway is you cannot. Um, October 7th didn't come out from a vacuum, and to say that is not to justify it. I think it's really important to be able to say October 7th is a result of a continued occupation of 75 years. And that does not justify the horrific attack that happened October 7th. And so to be able to say that, on many platforms, it's seen as almost justifying what Hamas did. Rather than justifying what Hamas did, it is saying that ignoring the problem in Palestine, ignoring the occupation, got us to where we are now. And the vast majority of officials, of diplomats that I have spoken to in our part of the world, and all the discussions from Riyadh to Abu Dhabi to Cairo to Baghdad, one answer is clear, we can't just move on, especially after the level of destruction. So my first point, old is new. My second point is the level of destruction. 29,000 at least dead. The level of infrastructure infrastructure damage in Gaza is huge. All of you have seen the news reports. But keep that in mind. This isn't about the cost of TV screens or the cost of shipping. This is about the unbelievable level of destruction and also the absolute level of trauma that Israelis now feel. So the idea that Israel can be protected that Jews from all over the world can decide to migrate to Israel and they will be absolutely protected, that militarily and intelligence-wise, the Israeli state had it under control. That myth is gone now. So the ramifications of that is huge. Third point is the West Bank. There's almost this idea that this is only happening in Gaza, but actually the situation in the West Bank, and as the US uh, National Security Advisor wrote just days before the terrible attack on 7th of October is that the West Bank is actually where we're concerned. Now everyone's thinking about Gaza, well, don't forget about the West Bank. Again, at least 350 people died, thousands have been arrested and so forth, but there's a huge problem, as we know, politically with the Palestinian Authority and likewise with the Israeli government. So these issues are not going to go away. We can't sidestep them even when, if and inshallah, there will be a ceasefire. The fourth point is the point I just alluded to, which is Israel's military and intelligence capability. There was huge interest in the region, in Israel, because there was a sense that actually if America is getting disengaged from the region, Israel is a good ally to have because they've got this. Well, they don't have this. I've spoken to um, intelligence officials, particularly from Western countries, and I said, well, how did you guys not expect something like October 7th to happen? Their answer was, we assumed, I actually heard the term assumed three times from three different uh, intelligence officials, we assumed that Israel had this under control. And that assumption was wrong. So I think all of this means it's coming to unhead. In addition to that, of course, we've had the ICJ proceedings. 
the statements, and if you haven't heard the full statements of some of the officials coming out to speak on all sides, I recommend you do. As journalists, this is what we look at, and we see the changes in tone. Changes in tone from not only Arab countries, but the Chinese statement to the ICJ will be heard loud and clear in the region. That is muted and very much different in comparison to what people are listening to when it comes from Washington. I know we'll touch upon Washington. The US's absolute support for Israel through this all has put a lot of the allies of the United States in the Arab world in a difficult position. It's only from their own people, but questioning what is going on in Washington that they can't even call for a ceasefire. We've never had a conflict where nobody says, hang on, don't kill so many civilians for months. It's only this month that we've started to hear that coming out of the Biden administration. And I think the fact that the term ceasefire became so politicized, the fact that you called for the protection of civilians, suddenly you were supporting terrorism, has shocked people globally. This is not just, I think, a, a regional matter. So when we look to the future, I think everyone's in agreement now, you need a solution, they need a Palestinian state. Again, ICJ moment was important, even if this drags on for years, it's a moment now where people want a change on that. But the other dynamic is the broken states of the region. So again, when we look at the Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the armed militia groups in Iraq, these are all the result of the fact that we have broken states that, again, people think we can sidestep. The one concern that often is not looked at is that those who bear arms are now seen as the victors from the Taliban taking over in Afghanistan, fighting for 20 years and then being able to declare victory, through to the Houthis now seen as the most potent power, to Hamas now having the label of giving Israel the biggest defeat it's had since its inception. What does that mean about all the other Arab armies? So if you are an unemployed young man who is really tired of their day-to-day -day life, there's a message there that the victors are the militants. And I think that is a long-term, strategic, geopolitical, frankly also geoeconomic consequence that we cannot ignore. Thank you very much, Mina. Uh, really a lot there and bringing in the latest from the Chinese statements and the Hague. Um, but you also mentioned Washington and that's a good uh, step to, to, to use to turn to. But, uh, who you, you've written a lot uh, about whether Washington can stabilize uh, the region, can trans transform the region, uh, most recently in foreign affairs, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I wanted to, to turn to you to ask what is Washington doing right now? What can it do under the current circumstances? And perhaps to address also on Iran-US relations and how that dynamic is also playing into what we're seeing in the region. Sure, uh, thank you. And thanks for uh, having us on this panel. Very grateful to the ICM dialogue for, for this opportunity. Uh, let me put also some a bit more uh, 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 sort of the strategic context for this. Uh, uh, I think, you know, the Gaza war is a transformative moment for the Middle East. It is a complete strategic reset, and it's very difficult to imagine a snapback to October 6th, uh, especially since we really don't even know how this war uh, will end. Uh, and I think that's where uh, we have to start, and that's where Europe, the United States, have to start thinking about this. Now, why is it a reset? First of all, the Palestinian issue is back on the table in a very big way. You know, the parenthesis that was opened with the Arab Spring, where the assumption became that the Palestinian issue is secondary to the region, and that we can forget about it, sidestep it. Uh, and, and these were real perceptions that led to, you could say, you could think about Abraham, of course, but think about the normalization of Saudi Arabia with Israel. It was all possible with the assumption that the Palestinian issue does not resonate with the Arab streets the way it used to. That is over. And it's not possible to go back now to those sort of uh, 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 years of pretending to have a two-state solution dialogue while settlements are being built and, and things are being pushed aside. So the, the, the force of the issue, the 30,000 Palestinians dead and maybe many more have now forcing with their blood, much more than Hamas, are forcing this issue that there has to be a final reckoning with, with, the, with the issue of Palestine. And, and you cannot think about the strategy of this region going forward without that being resolved. And I know it's controversial. There's not going to be an IMAC 
without uh, this issue being resolved. I mean, to think that you could draw a tunnel through uh, uh, you know, Jordan into Israel when uh, the issue of the West Bank is now sort of on a hot boiler and may explode, I don't know who would even put money into it or which co government's going to put money into it. I mean, one thing that resonates in this region is that nobody's going to pay for reconstruction of anything if it's going to be blown up uh, in, in a few years. Secondly, as, as Mina very aptly put it, the, the, uh, this crisis from the moment that, uh, that uh, Hamas attacked Israel, even aside from the horrors that, that happened, just the fact of the attack, suggested that Iran and the axis of resistance are power brokers you cannot ignore. That they obviously hold the card to turn the region on its head at any moment. And that uh, right now, every time you say Iran-backed, Iran is the problem. You're basically also attesting to the fact that they are the, they are the, they are the force, there, right? You're basically saying that the rest of the Arab world is not as important. It is Iran, Houthis, uh, uh, Hezbollah, uh, militias in Iraq that are, that are holding the card. And that, that gene is not going to go back in the box uh, very easily. And, and, uh, and so that's number two. Number three, Again, as Mina put it, uh, Israel's deterrence is gone. It, the region no longer looks at it as a 10 feet tall uh, you know, juggernaut that is invincible uh, uh, intelligence-wise, militarily, etc. And yes, Israel's tremendous military uh, capability and the way it has used it has inflicted unimaginable imaginable pain on, on Palestinians, but three months into this crisis, it actually has not achieved any of its real objectives. 80% of the tunnels are still there, two thirds of Hamas is still there, and they're nowhere near completing that despite this carnage. And so that actually changes a lot of the strategic dynamic uh, uh, in the region. And uh, 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 finally, back to the United States, the United States has proven itself to be completely ineffective. Uh, it, uh, you can forgive uh, the National Security Advisor for, um, for thinking that the Middle East is in, in its most peaceful uh, ever on October 6th. Many Arab governments, many in the region also thought that, right? And there was plenty of evidence uh, uh, around it. And, but ever since October 7, the U.S. has been behind. It didn't have a plan. It miscalculated. It didn't read what might happen in Gaza. And, and you have a situation where the uh, president and the administration puts forward an effort for, for a ceasefire or for a two-state solution, and basically it's rejected offhand, very publicly, and you can look at the vote that the Knesset gave uh, the, you know, two days ago, basically saying that you know, that's, that's dead on arrival. And so the U.S. actually has no capability, basically, of preventing, of ending this war, and even its capability of preventing it from escalating is, is, is open to question. Now this, we, we've talked so far about the U.S. leaving the region, which already was bad enough strategically. Now you're really talking about when they're here in the region, they actually have no impact on the outcome. They actually cannot basically get hold of this, this uh, situation. So in the region right now, the sense is that they're, they're basically free-floating. This conflict can go in... Any, any which uh, direction. And as was mentioned, also Hans mentioned it, that, that you know, this conflict may well escalate. And the escalation, uh, we have to know, uh, know, the escalation can come from Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, but it can also very likely come from Israel. Going into Rafah, which might mean doubling the number of people killed, tripling the number of people killed, or opening a front in, in the north, all of which obviously are decisions that Israel will make, it's not decisions that will be imposed upon it, will be a massive escalation. I mean, everybody in the region says that if there is a carnage going into Rafa, there is no way in which you can stop this from becoming much, much bigger. And, and let's not look at the situation that there's not mass uprisings in Arab streets. It could very well happen. Right, just because uh, we're, we're, we're on an October 6th situation with Arab stability, it doesn't mean that there's not an October 7th. You know, the, the Arab world is, is safe until it's not. I was watching a video of 60,000 people in a, in a soccer game in 
in Egypt chanting, uh, you know, we are one with Palestine because they're not allowed to do it on the streets. They do it in stadiums. But once carnage begins, if, if the border opens, if, you know, Palestinians are expelled, you know, the stability of Egypt is also in question. And I think everybody in the region understands it's a mistake for Europe or the United States to think that because there is stability right now, that there will be uh, stability uh, uh, going forward. Finally, I would say that, uh, you know, the, the, this also, this conflict changes the Middle East's position uh, uh, globally uh, as, a, as a conflict going forward. Uh, the, the first question is, how does this war end? Uh, does it end, at, aside from the carnage, let's say there's a ceasefire tomorrow, how long will it take to negotiate a two-state solution? What shape does it take? Who polices Gaza? You know, these are all issues that are going to consume our diplomats for some time to come. There's no sort of a sudden end to this. If uh, it, it has, even if there is a peace in Gaza, uh, uh, what what comes next, right? Is it an Iran-Israel confrontation, a shadow war, open war? Where does the Gaza conflict go forward? Exactly given what Nina said, that there's no larger plan for the region. Right? The sort of idea of IMAC and these, these ideas are good because they try to go around where there are broken places in the region. They go around Iraq, go around Syria, uh, go around Libya, not talk about them. Uh, and not talk about what might potentially be a much larger conflict looming between US and Iran, between Israel and Iran. Uh, and, and, and those issues are, are not going to go away. So in a way, the Middle East is going to be with world leaders for some time to come. There's no going back to sort of, we're just going to focus on Ukraine and China and the Middle East. And finally, I would say, if you that, right back, so just yeah. very quickly, that the Middle, this war can actually decide the American presidential election. That's as strategic as it is. And that is absolutely serious in the US. The anger of 18 to 34-year-olds, which Paul, after Paul says, the top issue for 18 to 34 year olds, particularly the Democratic Party, is Gaza. It's not student debt. And, and, and finally, as Mina said, the, the impact that this has had on the global South and the diminishment of European and American uh, credibility, uh, rule of law, uh, double stands, all of these sets of issues is going to take a while for itself to play out. And th these would be the strategic context for every other conversation. Thank you. Many good points in there. And I think even your point about the Arab Street and the U.S. election connects and that the Arab Street is not just in the region. The Arab Street is in many parts of the world. Uh, and, and that's really uh, of global importance. Maha, you're looking at the, at the region from Saudi Arabia, a country that had very big, has very big stakes in the connectivity part, the energy part, in um, the normalization pre-October 7th. Uh, how does it look from your standpoint uh, and uh, how has the polarization that has emerged in the region and globally affect that dynamic? Thank you. Thank you, Erna, and uh, thank you for uh, Rezina team for inviting me. Uh, namaste. I wanted to say that word since I came to India. Um, well, I'll start with a few points. First, starting with the uh, political paralysis that has uh, engulfed the UN, and particularly the UN Security Council, uh, which um, made it uh, ineffective in dealing with this crisis. And I will connect that with, uh, with the region in particular, uh, because it undermines the role of the multilateral diplomacy in peacemaking and peacekeeping. And we've already seen that even UNRWA and UN officials have been targeted in the, this uh, recent war in Gaza, which is uh, atrocious. Um, this uh, geopolitical divide and uh, polarization, which is not only between uh, the US and uh, Russia and China, but now we have clearly see a a uh, global north and a global south uh, divide, uh, which uh, has become even more uh, obvious with the uh, with the Gaza uh, war, uh, and uh, it, it will increase as we shouldn't even forget the other um, conflicts in the region that are still ongoing, also indicating this uh, divide between the north, uh, the global north, and the global south. Um, so this shows the helplessness of the international community in the face of state power and state sovereignty. Uh, so we're going back again to the rise of the state in determining uh, relations between countries. 
uh, which can lead to more tensions and uh, um, self-interested uh, conflict, uh, regardless of how it impacts the whole uh, region. Um, and therefore, the international system is failing to protect uh, um, defenseless uh, civilians. Uh, which brings me to the other point, uh, which is the uh, important role of civil society and citizens uh, themselves in um, raising their voice, expressing their views, even against the position of some of their own governments, particularly in the West, but also in the region. And uh, this is the role of the new uh, ICT, Information Communication Technology, uh, using social media to express the, themselves and to voice uh, their opinions. Uh, but unfortunately, even that is facing restrictions. And here we see, we see another divide between those who control the, inf the technology, information, and those who use it. And again, we see a lot of uh, uh, conversations uh, about uh, the limited uh, freedom of expression, the limited uh, freedom uh, that is supposed to be uh, uh, sacrosanct but yet it is uh, free for some, but not free for others. So again, this is creating another uh, division between uh, the global north and the global south. Um, another uh, uh, actors, and some uh, of my colleagues here have already pointed to, is the non-state actors, particularly environment non-state actors, who are challenging state power and the status quo and international relations and changing the whole dynamics of the relationship between uh, between countries, so playing a very active role in in this uh, in this part, and uh, the more the paralysis continues uh, at the uh, international organizations, uh, the more these non-state actors will find space to act. And as Mina said, we have uh, countries that are uh, 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 not stable, let's say, and th they provide opportunities for these non-state actors to become more uh, violent, to radicalize, and to uh, mobilize um, supporters. So yes, uh, uh, the, the continuation of this, uh, of this uh, attack on, uh, on uh, this war, uh, very horrendous and horrible uh, war on, on Gaza, uh, will have implications on, on the region. And the more that the international community fails to act, uh, the more it will escalate the tension. And I just want to say that um, the images that the people see of the suffering uh, in, in Gaza will not go away and disappear if and once the ceasefire is, is implemented. And these feelings towards the West will continue and the pressure will, uh, will still... Uh, um... So I'm gonna wrap up with the, saying the implications again for, for the region is uh, not only in disrupting trade, as uh, Hans mentioned, uh, uh, including uh, tourism, investments, uh, etc., but also this gr growing militancy uh, vulnerabilities and the uh, shifting nature of uh, warfare using, again, technologies, drones, that if these uh, non-state actors have access to, will create even more uh, problems and difficulties. And there could be a spillover effect of uh, radical groups exploiting um, these feelings and uh, mobilizing. And finally, um, again, looking at the human factor, uh, we forget uh, or choose to forget the uh, huge number of displaced people, refugees, uh, spilling, uh, moving into neighboring countries, which are already under tremendous economic and social pressures. Um, talking about Egypt, for example. Uh, so having uh, the, this added uh, suffering to that country is, again, uh, it, uh, could expo expose them to some uh, uh, internal uh, problems as well. Great, thank you for bring, bringing the, both civil society and non-state actor, but also the, the potential it's destabilizing, the many destabilizing non-state actors. Um, you mentioned that the international community has failed to act, and John was making that specific precise point in our conversation that in that failure the Arab states have also stepped up to try to uh, uh, to, to, to address the, the issue with their own initiatives, their own contact groups. So I want to turn to you John about what all this means about the foreign policy challenges of the regional actors and their strategic self-determination and more broadly how you respond 
to comments the other speakers have made and then for the sake of time after you make your comments I'll turn to the audience because I want to get some of the audience in and we will only have 10 minutes or so left so to you well, thank you very much. Now look at the clock and uh, very grateful for your um, elegant uh, chairing of this uh, session. I want to say a couple of things about the gap between foreign policy attitude and foreign policy delivery. India and also the six states of the Gulf Cooperation Council in the last five or ten years have gone through a period of what I style is strategic self-determination. So in the 1960s, 70s, all the rage in what is now called the Global South was political self-determination. It was about gaining that independence from former uh, colonial powers, having formal uh, sovereignty, uh, and being, uh, to a degree, the master of one's own uh, domestic politics. But the second stage in this that has come in the last five to ten years is uh, uh, what I style strategic self-determination where it's no longer the case that in Saudi Arabia when Mohammed bin Salman wakes up or in the UAE when uh, Mohammed bin Zayed wakes up that before they initiate a policy they say I wonder what the United States will think or do about this. That is not the first consideration. The first consideration is what must I do for my own people? How can I ensure that our economic growth is what it is? Uh, how do I uh, do things that uh, are helpful for uh, my region? And then you know, the United States and other powers will hopefully be uh, supportive of uh, these uh, goals. And in that process, both India and uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council states have been champions of different forms of what India calls multi-alignment. And from the perspective of these states, both uh, India and the GCC states, multi-alignment is a, a sensible policy. Jai Shankar in Munich even said it was the super smartest policy one uh, could have. And clearly it's better to have many friends rather than one, uh, more security suppliers rather than uh, a single one. Within the idea of multi-alignment is embedded essentially the concept of strategic hedging. But here's a rub. Strategic hedging rather like financial hedging, requires active portfolio management. So for India, as it looks at its multi-alignment, and it has a special relationship of long-standing with Russia, there might come a moment in one or two or three years where India concludes in our strategic portfolio, we're a little bit overweight Russia, and we have to maybe turn a bit more to France or somewhere else. The GCC and its multi-alignment was, or some of the countries, were moving very quickly. UAE, top of the train in the Abram Accords, Bahrain behind, Mohammed bin Salman saying that this is a possibility. Right now, some of those countries might think we're, we're a bit overweight Israel in our strategic portfolio, and we have to make certain we look uh, more carefully at our uh, base. And for the Arab countries, this is now uh, the number one priority. But there has been a gap between foreign policy attitude and foreign policy delivery. What we've heard here is the US isn't doing the right thing. The international community uh, hasn't stepped in. Uh, the United Nations is uh, failing. But has there been uh, a really important Arab initiative to put, to coin a phrase, diplomatic facts on the ground to outpace the physical facts on the ground that Israel is facing? Not quite yet. I've been chatting to a number of people about the idea that actually the Arab states or key certain ones should form a contact group. When we in Europe were struggling with Yugoslavia because NATO was the wrong actor, the EU wasn't capable, uh, uh, the UN wasn't there, we established a contact group to help accelerate the solution to the challenge of Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And there's a, a contact group evidently there in the making, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia whose uh, head of state is custodian of the two holy mosques, who is author in 2002 of the Arab Initiative. Saudi Arabia, very important. Qatar, because of its special relationship with Hamas. The UAE, because it was the first GCC country to decide to have the Abram Accords and has a certain geo-economic aspiration still uh, with Israel. Egypt, because of Gaza. Jordan, because of the West Bank. You take those five Arab states together, they have all the network that is relevant for trying to accelerate a solution and bring forth the idea of a two-state solution by reifying it. How do you reify it? 
how is Netanyahu gotten away for so long for refusing to have a, a two-party, a, a two-state solution? Oh, I got an aging and corrupt Palestinian administration in the West Bank and a bunch of terrorists in, in Gaza. Of course, there's no one to deal with. So if I'm an Arab state that wants to accelerate the two-state solution, what do I do? I think about creating a Palestinian state in waiting. And so what you might do without overburdening the democratic aspirations of the people in the West Bank or Gaza is to find 10 technocrats in, 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 in the West Bank who are 40-somethings, uh, 10 in, 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 the, in Gaza who are members of civil society, who are politically and militarily speaking second cousins once removed from the worst terrorists in Hamas, and you put up a Gaza administration, you say to the Israeli people, this, these Palestinians, these people from, from Gaza, that's the administration in waiting. These are the people who might govern the second state. And you accelerate diplomacy. You don't just say the U.S. is incompetent, the EU isn't doing anything, the U.N. Uh, is not uh, doing enough. We saw that other big actors, and I'll, change with us, I'll end with this point, uh, people were thinking China is so important in the Middle East. Look, they brought together Saudi Arabia and Iran. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you look at the picture of Wang Yi, he had on one side Iban, on the other side Shamkani, he wasn't the foreign minister of the two countries, it was the national security advisor of the two countries, which rather revealed to most observers that this was a very sort of specific sort of security de-escalation arrangement rather than a full-fledged uh, re-engagement uh, of each other. But China isn't doing this. So the Arab states, if they are really interested in strategic self-determination, should lead the way to creating a Palestinian administration in waiting that maybe other countries will begin to recognize and accelerate the process. Thank you. And I see the um, speakers looking. I see all the speakers looking at you with interest. So when we end at the very end of the session, I'd like to hear the other speakers react to your proposal. And thanks for bringing China in. I feel we haven't brought the Russia, Iran, North Korea, China axis in at all, but maybe one of the questions will be on that. Uh, we have Eight and a half minutes, so the floor is open for questions. So we'll take the gentleman over there. Is there a microphone in the room? Yes, so the gentleman on the table there on the right and the lady in red, both on the same table. Um, and we'll take the gentleman there and the lady in the back table, four, and then we'll get back to the speakers. Maybe one more if, if we manage. Good afternoon. That was a fantastic uh, outline of the situation as we see in the Middle East. Thank you, Nina. I think that was the most passionate exposition I've heard so far, and so clear. Thank you. Could you state who you are, please? Uh, I'm Rajiv Sena, and I'm a distinguished fellow at the ORF. And uh, I had a question for you, and uh, which is linked to what uh, John said, and that is, what's the inflection point on the Arab streets where people will come out and say, we've got to act? What is, what is, what are you waiting for? I mean, look, you yourself mentioned the massacre there, the, the photographs in the way. So what's the inflection point there? Very good question. So and that's the point I want to ask you. And to John, to you, I'd like to say, we in India, in our strategic portfolio, we may have Russia, but we also moved to our France. So I think we're doing it. Thank you. We have a lot of questions, so let's keep them short. And please state who you are when you start. The lady in the right, the same table, please. And if it's for one specifically one of the speakers, please follow the example of the first question and address it to them. Thank you. Um, thanks to the panel for very interesting interventions. And, and Nina, thank you. Um, it was wonderful. Um, my question really is about the Abrahamic Accords and their future. The, uh, there are reports that, in fact, September, um, October 7th happened because the Abrahamic Accords were accelerating and Saudi Arabia was on the point of perhaps uh, signing the, uh, or joining the, the accords, and that this was a preventive, preemptive measure. Uh, the other thing is that the October 7th really showed a divide between, I don't want to call it the Arab street, I find that a bit demeaning, but Arab populations and rulers, because clearly rulers were anxious to go into the but the populations, in fact, had much more sympathy with the Palestinian cause than anybody 
including their rulers, had recognized, certainly the West hadn't recognized. As you said, Nina, people thought, well, the Palestinian issue is over with and so on. And, and that showed that it was Could not. you please conclude? Because we yes. have three so questions. My question from... is, where do you see the Abrahamic Accords going after October 7th? And if and when, inshallah, there is a ceasefire. Thank you. Inflection point, Abraham Accords. A uh, question in the back. Uh, is at the table here first? The gentleman raising his hand. Please raise your hand so we can see you. And keep it short, please. Question for John Chipman. My name is Sarang Shidori. I'm director of the Global South Program at the Quincy Institute in Washington. Uh, you presented a fascinating peace plan uh, for the region. But my question to you is, uh, don't you think that, uh, A, governments can't be just created from outside and just brought in, and B, that any nation is built or state anywhere in the world through politics and not through technocrats. So, so these two fundamental principles of nation or state building uh, perhaps uh, don't align with your peace plan. So curious to hear your reaction on that. Thank you. Right. Input for the contact group. Uh, the lady in the back. Hi, uh, my name is Julia Rappleford. I'm from the University of Nottingham, our Malaysia campus. Um, first of all, I wanted to also briefly thank the whole panel for this brilliant coverage of uh, the issue because I think for the past days in different rooms of this the sessions of this conference, we've heard more about, oh my God, we have pro-Palestine, pro-Hamas protests on the streets of European cities. And apparently people do not make distinction between what's pro-Hamas, what's pro-Palestine, what's pro-peace. Uh, my question is addressed to Valin Astor, but if anyone wants to pick it up also, I'd, I'd be very grateful. Um, you probably have a unique perspective at uh, what's happening in the region and within the American politics as well. Uh, so far we've seen that most of the conflicts uh, between Israel and Palestine ended not because Israel or anyone else won, but just because the United States told Israel to do so. So how do you assess the perspective of forging this consensus in the United States to finally not only communicate to Israel to stop, but also to leverage on it, and at the same time, uh, connecting to what uh, John Chipman was talking about, the, the consensus of, uh, amongst the Arab states, for the United States pulling out that sort of leverage from the Arab states, for them to be able to uh, actively get engaged into realizing the two-state solution. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the last question for the gentleman in the back, really quickly, please. Uh. Indian Ambassador, two small questions. Okay. Israeli Prime Minister has been saying his objective is to obliterate Hamas forever. Is it realistic? Second is, there is nobody in cabinet to tell him what he is doing in Gaza. He is creating 10 times, 100 times more enemies for future generations. You can kill 30,000 Palestinians. You are creating 300,000 Palestinians in future who will be facing these Israelis full of bitterness, hatred for them. I think what he is doing is not evil. Thank you. Thank you. Important question for the future. So we started a bit late, so I would like to turn to Mina, who had a couple of questions, John and Vali, for the specific questions that were asked, and then I'll give Hans Christian and Maha uh, a minute to, to, to wrap up. So, Mina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you for the kind remarks. Uh, look, on the U.S., John, the reason everyone goes on about the U.S. is the U.S. is the one that keeps using the veto. So if the U.S. hadn't used its veto at the U.S. Security Council, the dynamic would be different. doesn't mean necessarily that Israel would heed the words of the U.S. Security Council, because they certainly haven't in the past. It would change the dynamic. So that's one. The second, U.S. military aid, financial aid to Israel. Again, to Valley's point about Americans caring about this, this is U.S. taxpayer money going to fund it. So again not Chinese direct aid, American, especially when the U.S. announced further aid after October 7th attack. So between the veto, top military aid, and political support, blatant political support, of course everyone's going to go on about the United States. In the mind of many people in the region and in Europe, frankly, there is a sense that America can choose to take a very difficult but important step of saying to the Israelis, I can no longer support this in our names. We're going to the famous James Baker moment. You have my number. Call me when you're ready to get serious. 
they have that leverage. Nobody else does. So I think that's very important. Um, and so therefore, I don't think it's an abdication of responsibility. It is dealing with the realities of America's strength and power. Um, second, Abraham Accords, it's, it's a very important question. It's a brilliant question in terms of Arab leaders and Arab street and the inflection point. Just want to make three points. The first is Valley mentioned that the Arab world is not as important because we talk about Iranian backed groups. I mean, the reality is the lesson that's being learned is might makes right. That if you bear arms, if you're willing to go into war, if you don't care about the stability of your people, then yes, you can continue to do this. But actually, if you want, like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and others, to have socioeconomic development and take your countries to the future, then you're kind of beholden to wanting to end conflicts rather than start them. And that's where the Abraham Accords thinking really was. It was trying to tell the Palestinians, we need to have a better option, we can't continue this way, but we're not going to be beholden to something we don't control. The UAE is different from Saudi Arabia in terms of its, again, the clout and place for Muslims, for Arabs and so forth. The UAE, it was established in 1971. The realities of 1948 and 1967 predate the establishment of the UAE. So for them, it's a completely different dynamic than for Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and others. And I think they were genuine about wanting to make it a warm peace. And I think that's what the Israelis are giving up now, that they won't break the Abraham Accords, because this was a strategic long-term vision. The idea of making it a warm peace between peoples, that's definitely now put in the freezer of a very cold peace. How that is rectified will take a long time. Um, inflection point, look, the Arab world, again, has gone through so much. Uh, and uh, again, Vali spoke about the uprisings of 2011. So people are both scared. Police forces are different. But we've seen activities on the streets, be it in Jordan, be it in Tunisia, in countries where there is that history of protesting. Again, you don't have a history of protesting in most of the Gulf states. So there's fear, there's security dynamics. And, you know, we can talk later, but I see time's up. So but I think there will be a point that the people feel it. And the Prime Minister of Qatar on stage in Munich said, my people are asking me about the alliances we have. And he was indirectly meaning the United States. So there is that pressure. You might not see on the streets, but it is definitely there in majlises and conversations. Um, so that sympathy is there and they're feeling the heat for sure. The UAE has a field hospital in Gaza that has Emirati doctors and nurses on the ground and they're coming home with stories that will affect society and people feel it. Just to John's point, I promise, just final point, there is an Arab initiative, 2002 not only. There is, a, at the moment, a contact group. They went to the member countries of the UN Security Council to convince them to work through multilateralism, through international diplomacy, and international rights. So I think there is an Arab I, uh, contact group. They are trying. Um, but Netanyahu has said he's not interested in a two-state solution. He's not the only one. There are key Israeli politicians who say we're not interested in that. Thank you. Vali, uh, I will ask you to keep it short and then mingle with the crowds and respond directly to the, to the people who ask questions. Sure. So, so very quickly, you know, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the formula that, that uh, Nina was mentioning, I think the Arabs are confident that they can deliver the Palestinians at, at the negotiation. They, I think they're fairly confident that they can even deliver Iran as well. They have now certain relationship to bring them along. But it's up to the United States to deliver Israel. The Arabs cannot deliver Israel. And it's not about what should uh, uh, the U.S. do or something. The rea we have to look at the reality. The reality is that the United States right now is not able to deliver Israel. I mean, the latest effort that the hostage release, et cetera, was rebuffed. The latest conversations about two-state solution were completely rebuffed in a very, very open, open manner. So that leaves the United States with really going to the, the maximum kind of pressure, which is to really try to pull the rug from under Israel's military effort, the domestic cost for that is, is, is high. And I don't want to sort of belittle this in, in the sense that the, that the United States is sort of in a big dilemma now. If the war was to stop right now, Israel loses. I mean, in the end, it's, uh, you know, what Henry Kissinger said, and people repeat now, that if the guerrillas don't lose, they win, and if the conventional military doesn't win, it loses. If Israel has not achieved the goals that it set, and it agrees to a ceasefire for two months, three months, and longer, essentially it's lost the war. And so that's difficult even for the U.S. to accept. Secondly, uh, that there is domestic pressure on the president from both sides. Pro-Israel groups, it's an election coming. But what is absolutely new about this uh, conflict 
is for the first time in the West and the United States, you actually have sympathy for the Palestinians in a way that you never had, that many in the Democratic Party did not see this, uh, this war through the prism of 9-11 as a war between, uh, you know, against terrorism, but saw it uh, as essentially in kind of a language of anti-colonialism and Palestinian rights. And that's a big, big pressure. And thirdly, that the United States is genuinely worried about escalation in the region because it really doesn't want a war in the region. It really doesn't want to go to war in the region. These are real concerns, but it's unable to actually stop the escalation without stopping the war. So it's damned if it does, and it's damned if it doesn't. And I think that's why it makes this so dangerous. It's not about what the U.S. should do. It's about what the U.S. could do. And, and I think that's, uh, it's, not, it's not easy to solve it. Let's put it that way. Recipe for strategic inaction. John, to you for your uh, yeah. response. Uh, I'll do uh, I'll do sound bites on technocrats, U.S. and Netanyahu. On on technocrats, uh, I think there's many governments in the world that have decided at certain stages of political instability or in order to advance at speed that they will uh, appoint technocrats in positions of authority. Uh, Jai Shankar is a technocrat, uh, but he's the most effective uh, foreign minister. Your minister for uh, ICT here, Weissner, is a technocrat, but he's a, a very efficient uh, uh, executor. Uh, if the BJP gets a very large uh, majority in this next election, I would imagine more technocrats would form uh, part of the, of the, of the uh, Prime Minister of India's uh, cabinet. Uh, the reason why technocrats uh, might be chosen for what I call an, a Palestinian state administration in waiting is that the politicians for of, of Palestine have failed, and they're seen as failures by their own people, um, and 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 they are dismissed by uh, many members of what is um, unusefully called the international uh, community. So create that uh, technocratic administration, show it, reify it, say this is a Palestinian state, then you can accelerate uh, discussions. Uh, what Mina says about the United States is, of course, exactly right. But as the Americans say in a, uh, in, in a rather vulgar way, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can say the U.S. shouldn't be, be vetoing this. You can say the U.S. should be putting more pressure on Israel. You should uh, say that the United States uh, needs to uh, insist on, on a ceasefire. And at the same time, uh, the Arab states can be accelerating the diplomatic pace. And I think uh, uh, that is something that needs to be done. On Netanyahu... For I'll me, stop you in half a second. For me, it's irrelevant as a matter of foreign policy strategy that Netanyahu states in public that he's against the two-state solution. We know that. <laughs> so you have to press uh, against that, work around it, uh, work underneath it. But don't stop at the first hurdle and say, well, Netanyahu has already rejected it, so it's better for the Arab states not to press too hard for a Palestinian state. That's, of course, wrong. And when the Prime Minister of Qatar stands up and says, this is urgent, that's why I call for a slightly more imaginative way of ensuring a Palestinian state rather than going back to the models that for the last 75 years have not worked as much. Thank you very much. Uh, Maha, your final comment? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, well, uh, Mina already said that in terms of the Arab Initiative, yes, uh, Saudi Arabia proposed the 2002 Arab Initiative. It has been on the table. It's still on the table, but Israel refuses to do anything. Uh, and it has not shown any uh, indication that it wants any peace in the region or to give the Palestinians the rights uh, for a state. So uh, that's where we are. And uh, in terms of the U.S., it's unfortunate that uh, now with the election season, we have candidates who are competing with each other in expressing their support to Israel and uh, uh, encouraging it to continue with its, uh, with its war. The only country that can stop Israel is the U.S. And unfortunately, it's not uh, uh, living up to that because unfortunately, we are in election season or civil season, as they say. Um, uh, in terms of Saudi Arabia's ro uh, role, uh, yes, Saudi Arabia now is a uh, uh, regional and a global uh, diplomatic uh, powerhouse. Uh, it has initiated and hosted many international conferences and uh, plays a, a major role in mediation. And it is now uh, uh, working with other uh, Arab countries on initiatives to, to stop uh, this war. And just another comment on uh, Hans, what he said that uh, the region is not as strategically important as, uh, as it seems. I would disagree with that. You wouldn't have all these uh, economic corridors that are running, uh, being uh, implemented through the region if it wasn't uh, strategically important. In fact, the uh, Middle East is in the middle, in the center of global attention. And all these new initiatives for uh, groupings, new groupings, including BRICS, or the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, 
are indications that uh, these countries are looking for other alternatives if the UN, in particular, Security Council, is not living up to its uh, uh, responsibilities. Thank you. Hans Christian, you started us out with some thoughts. What are you taking back to your Prime Minister, having heard uh, the panel? Uh... Um, well, I would say that the word climate has not been mentioned a single time. I think that we need to be looking more long term. How does the region as a whole, not all countries are diversified economically, not all countries have good governance, not all countries have managed corruption, but especially climate, climate, climate. The number of days with extreme heat will fivefold within a generation. This will have a huge impact and that will make the Middle East more strategic, but not from a positive point of view. That is what I fear, that is what I lose sleep over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, because one of our panelists have worked, has worked very much on this, I will also say the word women has not been mentioned, but uh, this only testifies to the fact that this panel should have been going on for two, two and a half hours. When I saw that I was asked to moderate a five-person panel in 50 minutes on this particular topic with these particular people, I thought it was impossible, and it was indeed impossible because we ran over. But I truly want to thank you. I learned so much from you. We've had such a diversity of views and depth of reflection. Thank you to the audience for extremely pertinent questions. Um, bon appetit, but some of you have already finished. Uh, and I invite you all in the tradition of Greek weddings to mingle with the speakers uh, and enjoy the rest of the lunch. So many thanks. Very congratulations.